So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writings, where we'll begin with a new text today, which will be a Jhumpa Lahiri's short story, A Temporary Matter. Okay, these days, uh, Shobha was always gone by the time Shukuma woke up. Uh, he would open his eyes and see the long uh, black hairs she shed on the pillow and think of her dress sipping a third cup of coffee already in her office downtown when she searched for typographical errors in textbooks and marked them in a code that she had once uh, in a, in, a, in a code that she had once explained to him with an assortment of colored pencils. Now we cut back into the present. So we given, and this is again a very fine artistry, but in different kinds, different points of time. So you know, we given the past. We given the past, which did had did mind the present in terms of the lost experience, in terms of the human tragedy, the experience. And then we cut back into the present, and we are told that by the time Shukma wakes up these days, Shoba is gone, sipping her third cup of coffee. Uh, in her office. And what does she do in that office? Uh, she searches for typographic errors in textbooks and marks and typographic errors. So she does copy editing, uh, presumably in an advertisement form, presumably in, an, in a publishing form. We don't quite know for sure at this point of time, but this is what we're told uh, in a very micro kind of description that she points out typographic errors in textbooks and marks them in a code that she had once explained to them with an assortment of colored pencils. She did the same for his dissertation. She promised when it was ready. Uh, so she said that you know, she would co also copy edit his dissertation when it is ready uh, and mark out the typographic errors. He envied her the specificity of her task, so unlike the elusive nature of his. So and this is a description that he we get that his dissertation, his uh, PhD or doctoral thesis uh, is obviously more abstract, is obviously more philosophical, academic. Uh, it has this academic abstraction about it. Uh, Compare and contrast it to that, uh, Shobha's uh, minute attention to details is very, very um, envious to him. I mean, he envies her, uh, the skill that she has for specificity uh, in terms of pointing out, in terms of mapping out the typographic errors here and there. He was a mediocre student who had the facility for absorbing details without curiosity. Uh, so we were given again a background in terms of his uh, uh, propensity as a student, in terms of his inclination as a student. So we told that he was a mediocre student, but he could absorb lots of details, he could absorb lots of data uh, without curiosity, without imagination. Until September, he had been diligent, if not dedicated, summarizing chapters, outlining arguments on parts of yellow lined papers. So, you know, we told that he was more or less collecting information at that point in time. That information was obviously uh, informing his thesis. But now he would lie in the bed until he grew bored, gazing at his side of the closet, on which Shoba always left partly open. At the row of the tweed jackets uh, and corduroy trousers, he would not, he would not have to choose from to teach his classes that semester. So we also told that he's not teaching this semester. Uh, and all the row of uh, uh, corduroy trousers and tweed jackets are uh, just left there unchanged, untouched, because he's not using them because he's not teaching that semester. After the baby died, it was too late to withdraw from his teaching duties. But his advisor had arranged things so that he had a spring September to himself. Shukma was in a sixth year of graduate school. That in the summer should give you a good push, his advisor had said. You should be able to wrap up things up, wrap things up by next September. So, you know, that was the condition that he had at that point of time because he was obviously he lost the baby and it was a deep human tragedy. And he, uh, it was too late for him at that point in time to pull out of the teaching responsibilities next semester. But his advisor uh, had arranged for this somehow and advised him to take a break. Uh, and told him you know, that in the summer next, we should give you a push and by next September, you should be able to wrap things up uh, in terms of submitting your dissertation. So, you know, this is a story about uh, two very different um, individuals, individuals with very different skills uh, who were partners to each other. And we find that what Shukuma is going through now uh, is an inertia, is a limbo state where he is completely unproductive, where he can't function properly uh, and where he's always absent-minded, where he's always um, lethargic. And he can't bring himself to work, he can't bring himself to function, he just lies on his bed all day, uh, staring at the ceiling, uh, not doing anything apart from the banal duties in the house, uh, apart from cooking and, you know, doing his little household codes. Apart from those chairs, he does nothing, he doesn't step out of the house, he doesn't collect mails, he doesn't buy grocery, he doesn't buy wine. Uh, so he, he gets more and more withdrawn into this state of limbo, nothingness that he finds himself in. Uh, pause the child loss. And we, we're given more detailed descriptions uh, in terms of uh, what he's doing. And we are told that, but nothing was pushing Shukuma. Instead, he thought of how he and Shobha had become experts at avoiding each other in the three bedroom house, spending as much time on separate floors as possible. So, you know, a lot of time is spent not talking to each other. 
uh, these days. A lot of time is spent uh, avoiding each other these days uh, in the three bedroom house, uh, you know, and, and they spend time on separate floors if possible. This is a point in the story where we begin to get a description of the, of the crisis in communication that these two people have. Uh, they keep talking just so they don't have to speak to each other in a proper way. So they keep talking about peripheral things. Uh, they keep talking about uh, things surrounding them, but very rarely, if any, 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 any time at all, they talk to each other in ways that they have a proper conversation and proper dialogue. Okay? So he thought of how he no longer looked forward to weekends when she sat for hours on a sofa with the colored pencils and the files, so that uh, he feared that putting on a record on his own house might be rude. Uh, he thought of how long it had been since he looked into his eyes, and since she looked into his eyes and smiled. I whispered his name on those rare occasions they still reached for each other's bodies before sleeping. So that kind of intimacy is lost, that kind of intimacy of looking into each other and re reaching out to each other uh, before sleeping, that kind of intimacy is waning out, is uh, petering out as it were. Pulse the child loss, pulse the trauma of the child loss, uh, pulse the tragedy, pulse an absence. So that absent child in the story becomes a very, very conspicuous presence in a very spectral way because that informs the absence which happens subsequently, that informs the crisis of communication that happens subsequently, that informs the collapse of communication as it were uh, between these two people who used to love each other uh, very intensely at one point of time. In the beginning, he had believed that this, it would pass, that he and Shoba would, would uh, get through a through it all somehow. In the beginning, there was some hope that it would get through it somehow. She was only 33. Uh, she was strong on her feet again, but it wasn't a consolation. It was often nearly lunchtime when Shukuma would finally pull himself out of bed and head downstairs to the coffee pot, pouring out, uh, out the extra bit uh, Shobha left for him, along with the empty mug on the countertop. So again, we're told uh, space, the spatial, spatial temporal thing is very important over here because we're told that it'll be almost lunchtime when Shukuma would pull himself out of bed, head downstairs to the coffee pot uh, and pour himself a coffee. You know, and the whole sense of time is very different because Shoba by the time it will be in her office, having worked half a day, but Shukuma would just wake up barely, crawl downstairs and have a cup of coffee with the Shoba left for him in the morning uh, on the countertop with an empty mug on the countertop. So, you know, he obviously has a very different kind of lifestyle here compared to Shoba uh, and that difference is uh, obviously um, something to do with her inertia of not functioning, the inertia, not accepting the fact uh, that they, they have lost a child and that makes him more and more withdrawn. Whereas Shobha, on the other hand, uh, looks for an excuse to work, to step out of the house and just you know, completely absorb herself away into all kinds of external work activities just so she doesn't have to think about this loss and just so they don't, don't, they don't need to have a proper communication at all. So they can just keep talking about peripheral things, unimportant things. Uh, but that's, that's the important bit of the story, that's the reason why the peripheral unimportant conversations, the peripheral unimportant objects become so important because they actually become pointers to things that are not said, uh, to the to objects that are not mentioned. And like any great storyteller, what Lahiri really excels in, uh, in terms of telling you things which are not being said, right, and telling you, showing you objects which are not being shown. So like all great storytellers, um, that, like all great writers of short story, uh, what is not said, what is not mentioned, what is not spelt out becomes uh, exponentially more important than what is actually spelt out. Okay, and that's something which uh, happens at a very human, intimate level in Lyra's fiction. Okay, Shukuma gathered onion skins in her hands and let them drop into the garbage pail. On top of the ribbons of fat he trimmed from the lamb. He ran the water in the sink, soaking the knife and the cutting board, and rubbed a lemon half along his fingertips to get rid of the garlic smell a trick he had learned from Shoba. So we give him a very detailed description of how he was cooking a lamb curry. Uh, it was 7.30 in the evening. Uh, through the window, he saw the sky, uh, like a soft black pitch. Uneven banks of snow still lined the sidewalks, uh, though it was warm enough for people to walk about without hats or gloves. So this is March, this is the um, end of winter, but there is still some remnant of snow uh, in the distance. Uh, people are walking without gloves or hats. It's warming up, but then it's still there's some snow happening. So, you know, this is a time uh, which is also quite liminal in quality. It is between summer and winter, March. And that liminality is important for us in the story uh, because a uh, large part of the story is about liminality, is about transitions, is about moving from one register to another register, is moving from one kind of science system to another science system, between uh, from happiness to absence, uh, from winter uh, to summer. Uh, and you know this transition from a very wintry, cold, uh, bare landscape into a more summery landscape 
uh, that transition is important in the story because um, that is a liminality that is being mentioned uh, in the very detailed descriptions over here. Nearly three feet had fallen in the last storm, so that uh, for a week people had to walk single file in, in narrow trenches. So again, the word trench is important because that's a war metaphor. But the snow had happened so thickly that people had to walk in one line in a very narrow trench. For a week, that was Shukumar's excuse for not leaving the house. But now the trenches were widening and water drained steadily into grates in the pavement. So, you know, that was a very good excuse for Shukumar not to leave the house. He would just stay in the, in the house forever because there was a very heavy snow outside and there were trenches which were made where people just walk in a single file, uh, like soldiers marching in, in very narrow, claustrophobic trenches. Yeah, but that's long since gone. Uh, and then Shukumar obviously still doesn't leave the house for obvious reasons. Okay, and then he tells uh, Shobha that um, the lamb won't be done by eight. Shukumar said, we may have to eat in the dark, right? So, you know, it, it'll be Palka from eight o'clock. And he tells Shobha that I'm still cooking the lamb and then, you know, it won't be done by eight. So we might have to light candles. And this is what Shobha suggests. We can light candles, Shobha suggested. Uh, she unclipped her hair, coiled neatly at a nape during the days and pried the sneakers on my feet without untying them. I'm going, to, I'm going to shower before the lights go, she said, heading for the staircase, I'll be down. Now this becomes very important because, you know, the whole idea of a candlelight dinner uh, is traditionally very romantic, it's traditionally a symbol of love, romance, uh, felicity, happiness, etc. But observe how uh, this becomes a necessary condition uh, and this becomes a temporary condition. Uh, that, that connects with the title of sorry, a temporary matter because the whole idea of candlelight dinner over here becomes a necessity because it's a power cut, right? Uh, because of the power there's no power. So these two people are forced to have a candlelight dinner, like lovers, uh, like romantic people. But then we are told that this is actually, uh, and that is a very excellent way of writing a story because that completely inverts and problematizes uh, the stereotypical signifiers of love, romance, fulfillment, etc. So the candlelight dinner over here becomes uh, a compulsion uh, to these three people at this point in time. And that is obviously something that is being hinted at over and over again in the story. And then she tells him, I'm going to take a shower before the lights go. She said, heading for the staircase, I'll be down. I'll just come down the moment I'm done. Shukuma moved her satchel and her sneakers to the side of the fridge. She wasn't this way before. And then we are told again how the transition has happened, how she has become a different person, post the child loss, etc. So she wasn't this way before. She used to put her coat on the hanger, her sneakers in her closet, and she paid bills as soon as it came. So she was a very meticulous, careful person. Uh, she put exactly the hanger, uh, the, the, the coat on the hanger where it was supposed to go. The sneakers would be in a closet and she paid all the bills in time. Uh, so she paid a lot of attention to details earlier. But now, she treated the house as if it were a hotel. And that's, again, a very, very important word, hotel. So what's the difference between a house and a hotel? Uh, a hotel is a temporary matter. A hotel is a liminal place. A hotel is where people come and go. A hotel is where people don't live. They stay uh, for a period of time and then they go away. And that transition, that difference between a home and a hotel is something which is very symbolic in quality. And that's something we are told about Shoba, that she treats this house as if it were a hotel, that she's about to leave at some point in time. Right? And that is a hint which is given to us right away, just one word, hotel. And this is um, what we call in literature the economy of expression. So with very few words, with almost minimalist words, we are told so much, we are given so much information uh, that uh, it's not so much in information, there's so much interpretation. Then you have interpretative information. We are told that you know, this is something which may happen. Uh, we might start anticipating certain things with just one word, hotel, right? So she treated the house as if it were a hotel. The fact that uh, the yellow Shen's armchair in the living room was a uh, living room clash with the blue and maroon Turkish carpet no longer bothered her. So initially, uh, before that, you know, she was be bothered about uh, the compatibility of colors or the lack of it. But right now, the yellow armchair and the blue and maroon Turkish carpet, you know, they did not match at all in terms of uh, the color combination, but it didn't bother her anymore. Uh, on the enclosed porch at the back of the house, a crisp white bag still sat on the wicker chairs, filled with lace she had once planned to turn into curtains. So again, things left undone, things left half finished, uh, things which are incompatible. And these descriptions become very important because these have become pointers uh, to the psychological condition of these two people. The fact that certain things have been left undone, certain things have been left you know, unfinished, interrupted, just like the unborn child, uh, the dead child. Uh, you know, it was supposed to be a fulfilling experience, but then it turned out to be a frustrating 
tragedy, a great tragedy, a great interruption which has marked them with a loss forever, with a sense of permanence about it. While Shobha showered, Shukuma went into the downstairs bathroom and found a new toothbrush uh, in this box beneath the sink. The cheap, stiff bristles hurt his gums and spit some blood into the basin. The spare brush was uh, one of the many stored in the metal basket. Shoba had bought them once when they were on sale in the event that a visitor decided at the last minute to spend the night. Now again, look at the symbolic significance of this uh, particular episode. These are brushes which were meant for visitors. Uh, these are brushes which Shoba had bought in bulk uh, just so if a visitor came for dinner or stayed back and had to stay back uh, the last second, there'd be some toothbrushes for them. Now Shukuma, who presumably is the owner of the house, presumably you know, lives in this house, he's using the toothbrushes which are meant for visitors. And if we connect that to the idea that Shobha uh, treats his house like a hotel, then the two make a connection and we have a sense that both these people uh, realize that this is not something which uh, can be a permanent home for them anymore. This is something which might end, this sojourn might end at any point of time, this stay might end at any point of time. They're not really living here anymore, they're staying here. And like any stay, you know, they feel like visitors, uh, they might just go at some point in time, okay? Uh, so, you know, this again, very symbolic uh, little bit about using a visitor's toothbrush is very, very important and it's very meticulously uh, curated for us as readers. And you know, we are told, we are given the symbolic significance of this episode in a very beautiful graphic way. Okay, it was typical of her. So again, we are told that this is what Shubha was like when, you know, uh, when, when, you know, when she used to be uh, happy when she used to be her, her true self before she lost a child. It was typical of her. She was a type to prepare for surprises, uh, good and bad. So she wanted to prepare for everything. She wanted to be in a state of preparedness at all times. If she found a skirt or a purse she liked, she bought too. She kept the bonuses from her job in a separate bank account in her name. It, it didn't bother him. It hadn't bothered him. His own mother had fallen to pieces when his father died. Abandoning the house, he grew up and moving back to Calcutta, leaving Shukuma to settle it all. He liked the Shukuma was different. So again, we, if you look at this intergenerational difference that has been described over here, it's very, very interesting because we are told that Shukuma's mother was completely, uh, she just collapsed, she just completely got, uh, she disintegrated uh, existentially when his father died and uh, uh, abandoning the house that he grew up and he, she went back to Calcutta. Um, you know, leaving Shukuma to settle everything you know, in terms of legal affairs, in terms of ancestral property, etc. And he liked it very much. The Shoba was very different. The Shoba was more autonomous, more independent. Uh, she took care of things and she was perfectly capable of doing things on her own. It astonished him, her capacity to think ahead. When she used to do the shopping, the pantry was always stocked with extra bottles of olive and corn oil, depending on whether they were cooking Italian or Indian. So again, look at the very careful attention to details that Shoba had at one point in time. So there was uh, olive oil and corn oil. Olive obviously was for Italian cuisine um, and uh, corn oil was for Indian cuisine. But the fridge is always stocked with different kinds of oil just so they never run out of the ingredients uh, when they're making a meal for themselves. There were endless boxes of pasta in all shapes and colors, zippered sacks of basmati rice, uh, whole sides of lambs and goats from the Muslim butchers and hay market, chopped up and frozen in endless plastic bags. Every other Saturday, they wound through the maze of stalls. Shukuma eventually knew by heart. So, you know, there was a very busy domestic happiness that has been described away in great detail. So they would just go around um, and buy things from the butchers and hay market. You know, uh, they would just walk through all the stalls, the maze of stalls, and Shukuma eventually knew every stall by heart, every stall owner by heart, because, you know, he'd just keep visiting every now and then. Uh, he watched in disbelief uh, as she bought more food trailing behind her with canvas bags as she pushed through the crowd, arguing under the morning sun with boys too young to shave but already missing teeth, who twisted up brown paper bags of uh, artichokes, plums, ginger root and yams, and dropped them on the scales and tossed them to Shoba one by one. So she would bargain and, you know, uh, and debate with them in terms of quality, in terms of price. And he would just be this very happy uh, standby person, he would just stand by and watch and, help, and carry everything in a, in a big, basket that they would use to shop. She didn't mind being jostled even when she was pregnant. She was tall and broad-shouldered with hips that her um, obsession is short were made for childbearing. During the drive back home as a, car, as a car curved along the Charles, they invariably marveled at how much food they had bought. So 
So what we see is there was a, there's an image of a recurring image of overabundance, uh, a recurring image of fulfillment uh, of having being super saturated with food and you know and all things which are functional, which which are you know necessary for running the house. But it becomes more than necessary. They buy excess food. There's an image of excess, an image of overabundance, an image of happiness, an image of uh, fertility. Uh, the fertility image comes at the end, obviously, uh, with the uh, obstetrician talking about uh, how Shobha, you know, is perfectly suitable for childbearing. So it all connects together in a very organic way: fertility, abundance, felicity, happiness, fulfillment, etc. Uh, and then we are told to drive back home as a car curved along the Charles. They invariably marvelled how much food they had bought. They were surprised in terms of how much food they had bought, in terms of being happy about it. Uh, and if you compare and contrast this image of felicity, happiness, fulfillment, abundance to the image that is now of you know bare minimalist, almost nothing, a bare fridge with just a calendar attached to it, uh, the contrast is dramatic. The contrast is complete. It's sort of clinical uh, in terms of how things have changed um, since the child lost, since the death of the child. But we also told immediately in terms of all the food that they bought, it never went to waste. When friends drove by, Shobha would throw together meals and they appeared to have taken half a day to prepare from things she had frozen and bottled, not cheap things and tins, but peppers she had marinated herself with rosemary and chutneys that she cooked on Sundays, uh, stirring boiling pots of tomatoes and prunes. Her labelled mason jars lined the shelves of the kitchen in endless sealed pyramids, enough uh, that agreed to last for their grandchildren to taste. So, you know, this whole idea of making uh, pickles. Uh, and uh, you know different kinds of marinated things uh, labeled in mason jars uh, endlessly and becoming sealed pyramids uh, you know it, it became an image that they agreed they would last their grandchildren in terms of um, the pickles that they made and this be again becomes very very this food description becomes very very interesting because what uh, this marinated pickles what is marinated combinations uh, suggests is that th these last for a lot of time, these last for lifetimes, these last for generations, you know, these are the preservatives. Uh, and the whole idea of making food which will last them for generations, uh, it gives them a sense of, uh, uh, you know, triumphing over time. So that, you know, even after they go away, this will last, this will stay on and this will, you know, be used by our grandchildren. So that the food becomes a marker of time over here. The food becomes a marker of uh, posterity, a marker of perpetuity, a marker of permanence, a marker of intergenerational uh, temporality. Uh, and that becomes an image of happiness for them. That becomes uh, a knowledge of happiness for them, that they're going to have a child and then th th that child will have more children and it will just be intergenerational. But this food that we're preparing at the moment in terms of having these boxes and tins uh, which will make a pyramid uh, will last for not just a lifetime but also intergenerationally uh, for our grandchildren. So it's important to see how food becomes a marker of memory and posterity and perpetuity over here. That eaten and old by now, Shukuma had been going through the supplies steadily, preparing meals for the two of them, measuring out cupfuls of rice, defrosting bags of meat day after day. He combed through her cookbooks every afternoon, following her penciled instructions to use two teaspoons of ground coriander seeds instead of one, or red lentils instead of yellow. Each of the recipes was dated, telling the first time they had eaten the dish together. So again, temporality becomes a very important thing. and this whole combination, the whole dialogue between food and time becomes very, very important. Food being a marker of time, you know, each time they consume a certain dish, they would write it down, the time, the date on a calendar. April 2nd, cauliflower with fennel, January 14th, chicken with almonds and sultanas. He had no memory of eating those meals, meals and yet they were there recorded in a neat proofread, proofreader's hand. Uh, Shukuma enjoyed cooking now. It was the one thing that made him feel productive. If it weren't for him, uh, he knew Shobha would eat a bowl of cereal for her dinner. So the whole idea of being productive uh, relies or, or rests on the cooking over here. And the productive obviously has an academic metaphor attached to it. Uh, if you're a productive academic, that means you're publishing, it means you're producing conference papers, it means you're doing things which take boxes in terms of productivity. But that has long since stopped, uh, Shukuma realizes. And the only thing which makes him feel productive is cooking meals uh, in the kitchen. Uh, and then we are told that if it hadn't been for him cooking fresh meals every single day, Shuma would eat a bowl of cereals, uh, a bowl of cereal for a dinner. And the whole image of someone eating a bowl of cereal for dinner uh, obviously suggests that there is no kitchen, there is no 
fresh food, there's no warmly cooked food. And that also connects to the idea of losing the home, uh, of the home going away, the absence of home, of the depletion of home. And that connects back to the metaphor of the hotel, the metaphor of the toothbrush, meant for visitors, etc. So all these things connect in a very organic, intimate way to the landscape of the story, as we see. Okay. Tonight with no lights, they would have to eat together. So again, look at the word, the, the most operative word over here is have. They would have to eat together. So because there are no lights, they can't sit in separate compartments, sit in separate rooms uh, and have their own food. They are compelled to come together, uh, light up a candle and eat together for the first, first time after many, many months perhaps. For months now, we are told, for months now, they had served themselves from the stove and he had taken his plate into the study, letting his meal grow cold on his desk before shoving it into his mouth without pause. While well, Shobha took a plate into the living room and watched game shows or proofread files with an arsenal of colored pencils at hand. Right? So they've been, and this alienation becomes very dramatic and very clearly mapped out in great detail. So we are told that previously, for months now, they would serve themselves from the pot in the kitchen and eat separately. And if you look at the manner of eating, the difference in the manner of eating, that becomes interesting because Shukma would take the plate to his study and let the meal grow cold, uh, you know, and then um, just eat it mechanically without, without pausing, just shove it down his mouth without pause. Well, Shobha took a plate in the living room, watched a game show, continued to work and ate a meal. So this complete disconnect which is there between the two people is very carefully delineated over here in very, very intimate details. At some point in the story, at some point in the day, uh, in the evening, she visited him. When he heard her approach, he would put away his novel and begin typing sentences. Uh, and this obviously is a very, very delicate but very symbolic little short sentence that she would visit him at some point. And now, why would I need to visit someone if you're living in the same house? The word visit obviously uh, has a lot of things packed into it. I should visit him from a distance. You can only visit someone from a distance. So when I say I'll go and visit someone, that means I'm living somewhere else, and that person living somewhere else. So I'll go and travel and meet the person, right? So that obviously uh, indicates that that implies that there's a distance between us already, right? Now, when you say that two people are living in the same house and one person visits another person, that means there's a lot of mental distance uh, which is there between the two people. So the whole idea of visiting becomes very important and it's very suggestive as well. When he heard her approach, he had put away his novel uh, and begin typing sentences. So he would mostly read novels, he would mostly consume novels in a very mechanical way and not be productive, not work on his dissertation. But when he heard her approach, when he heard her footsteps, he put the novel away and started typing sentences, started pretending to walk uh, you know, on a dissertation. She would rest her hands on his shoulders and stare at with him in the blue glow of the computer screen. Don't walk too hard. She would say after a minute or two and head off to bed. So you find this is beautiful in terms of the descriptions that uh, Larry is giving. Uh, the wife, obviously melancholic, having lost a child, getting more and more alienated from the husband, and the husband, you know, not being able to work, not being able to be productive academically, just reading novels mechanically, eating food mechanically, uh, and just you know, the, the moment the wife comes in, you know, he pretends to work, and then she comes, uh, you know puts a hand on the shoulders and, you know, for a minute and then says don't walk too hard and then heads off and goes to sleep. So there's a complete crisis in communication between people who love each other, uh, people who experience a tragedy together, a uh, great tragedy of loss and absence together. And that kind of an experiential condition is described in great details with perfect symbolic signifiers in the story. Uh, and then we are told it was the, uh, it was the one time in the day that she sought him out and yet he had come to dread it. So it was the only time of the day when Shobha would come and reach out to Shukuma, come and touch him maybe uh, before going to sleep. And yet we are told he had come to dread it. He had been, you know, he, he is fearful at the time. He doesn't like the time at all because he constantly fears of being found out uh, that he's not working. He knew it was something she forced herself to do. So it was, I mean, he was perfectly aware of the fact that this is something which is mechanical. This is something that she is doing out of compulsion, that she is sort of, it's like a routine to her. Uh, visiting Shukuma uh, before going off to sleep, forcing herself to do it. She looked around the walls of the room which they had decorated together last summer with a border of matching marching ducks and rabbits playing trumpets and drums. By the end of August, there was a cherry crib under the window, a white changing table with mint green knobs, and a rocking chair with checkered cushions. Shukuma had dis dis disassembled it all before bringing Shoba back from the hospital. 
scraping off the rubbles and ducks with a spatula. For some reason, the room did not haunt him the way it haunted Shoba. In January, when, she stopped, when he stopped working at his carol in the library, he set up his desk there deliberately, partly because the room soothed him and partly because it was a place Shoba avoided. So again, the relationship between space and embodiment becomes important. Uh, we saw that in the yellow wallpaper as well, uh, how you know, space produces claustrophobia, which then produces certain gendered, um, embodied uh, identities uh, and experientiality. And we have a similar situation over here. Uh, there was a nursery that they had built together uh, as prospective parents, as parents who were expecting a child. Uh, and then obviously when the child died, uh, he had come back home and taken it and disassembled it, everything. Uh, and his room uh, had haunted Shobha, but it didn't haunt him uh, for the same way. And she, he saw, he set up his, his study away uh, and stopped walking in the library. And one of the reasons why he did it is because he, um, he knew that uh, this was a place Shobha avoided. So they want to avoid each other. They want to avoid having direct communication, having a you know, consistent organic communication. So everything else becomes peripheral in quality. Everything else becomes uh, sort of tangential in quality. There's no directness. Um, you know, that is there. And so this constant avoiding of each other becomes a very important part of the story, uh, part of the narrative, part of the experience that they're having at the same time together. So this, the whole idea of bearing a loss together, the whole idea of experiencing a loss together and then moving away from each other becomes very much a part of the narrative. And we see how the symbolic signifiers, the descriptions, the details, the objects, the markers, the tangible markers, everything else around uh, become pointers to this crisis of communication, the space, the rooms, the, uh, the wallpaper, the furniture, the children's nursery. Again, an unfinished business, uh, like the unfinished uh, uh, pillows, which I described uh, previously, unfinished, interrupted, not done, half done. So the, all these become very, very important in the story. And they all become pointers to the human condition of unfinishedness, uh, interruptedness. Right? So these become very, very important at different points of time. Okay, so we'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with the story in the next lecture. But what's important is for us to understand is when you look at the relationship between gender, the body, corporeality, discursivity in the story, it all becomes very, very important and all becomes very, very uh, carefully curated in library's fiction. And that's something we'll continue to explore in the lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.